right, we are going to be in Ephesians chapter 4, as Kyle said, uh, as some of you still making your way there, just by way of introduction. So, uh, the summer of 2004, my wife and I thought it'd be a good idea to rent a, um, a houseboat out on Lake Powell. Any of you ever done that? You ever rent a houseboat on Lake Powell? Are you astounded like me? Like, all you need is a check. That's all you need. You just need money. They will let anybody take a boat. We took a 30-foot houseboat out on Lake Powell, which, which has to be a mistake. Um, and, you, you know, you just take this thing out there, and it's like, God help you. You know, you just get blown around by the wind. 30 feet, it's like just driving a huge sail. And so <clears throat> we go, we bring our kids, and uh, <clears throat> uh, my, uh, my niece comes with us, uh, my daughter's boyfriend comes with us, and, and it's just Brenda and I. And, then, and so we go, and we're having a good time. And when you, when you park the things for the night, you, you try and find a beach and you just sort of pull the bow up on the, on the sand a bit. And then they've got like four anchors the size of Volkswagens and you just have to dig to China and bury these anchors and hope that they hold. So we, we anchor the boat, but then the wind picks up and the anchors all break loose and the boat is like about ready to crash into these rocks and so Brenda, she's in our boat, like acting like a tugboat, you know, just trying to keep the boat off of the rocks. And I'm yelling, I'm like, I, I need help. So it's me, it's my, I don't know, my son's eight at the time, he's got a little eight-year-old friend. And then my daughter's worthless boyfriend who's there. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> so I go running into the cabin, like trying to find this guy, and he's, he's in the living room part, and I said... I need your help out here right now. And this kid looks at me, and I kid you not, he says, I just put my jammies on. <laughs> I'm like, then stay in here with the girls, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> now let me summarize the trip for you up until this point. Our contribution to this vacation, Brenda and, and myself, was we paid for the car. We paid for the gas, we paid for the boat rental, we paid for the food, we did all the driving, uh, we, we you know, covered <clears throat> all the logistical needs of the trip. Now, Jammy Boy wasn't there to contribute. <laughs> he was there to consume. And so he was content to doze while I drove, he was content to lounge while others labored, and to consume while others contributed, and when the crisis hit and it was all hands on deck, he was all about himself. Jammy boy didn't last long in our family, I'll just tell you that. Now, I tell you that story because we're currently going through a value series here, uh, and we're examining the eight values that shape and inform everything that we do um, as a church. What we value shapes what we do, and what we do establishes our culture, so values are important. And here at Reliance Church, the value we're going to look at today is the value of serving and how appropriate that on, on, on Veterans Weekend, Veterans Day weekend, that we would talk about serving, that we value that as, as a church. We articulate that value this way. We say that we are contributors, we are not consumers. Why? Well, because Jesus himself was a servant, Mark 10, 45 tells us, for the, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And the Bible makes it clear that God expects nothing less from us. We're in Ephesians 4, just back a couple of chapters in chapter 2, Paul would say this to the Ephesians. He says, we are his workmanship that we are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. If you've heard me teach on this before, if you've heard me quote this, this scripture, I'll often point out that word workmanship. It literally, mean, literally means poem or work of art. And, and the idea is that God has created each one of you uniquely, very peculiar, individually, he has created and crafted you to be that unique part of the larger body of Christ. And so we have this unique, special function and duty 
that we have, have been created in and that we are expected to contribute to the larger body. And in, here in Ephesians chapter 4, beginning now in verse 1, here's what Paul says. <clears throat> he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And these verses should be familiar to you because this was a section we went to when we were talking about unity in the body of Christ, another value that we have a few weeks ago. Paul continues in verse five, he, or in verse four, he says, Therefore, or rather, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all, and where he's moving, he's emphasizing one God, one faith, one baptism, one spirit, and he's going to go on now and say there's only one you, that you're unique as well. Here's what he goes on to say, he says, but to each one of us, verse 7, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he, led, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. God has given to you and me specific gifts for use in the body of Christ. We skip to verse 11, continue. And he himself, Paul says, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors <clears throat> and teachers... For the equipping of the saints, that's you, for the work of ministry, for the edifying or the building up, that's what edifying means, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till, he says in verse 13, we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children." Tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But, verse 15, speaking the truth in love may grow up <clears throat> in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself, the building up of itself, the body of Christ in love. And so this important text that we read here, what Paul is saying, he's saying that Jesus, rather than being a consumer, that he came as a servant. And, and he's saying that having served us so faithfully, so wonderfully, that you and I, we now have a, du a duty to serve. That he, even though we have been uniquely and individually crafted by God uh, with individual talents, that those unique gifts are meant to be contributed to the larger work in the body of Christ. That's what Paul is saying here. And this, by the way, this is a truth that's carried throughout the Bible. In Mark's gospel, we read about Jesus sending out his disciples two by two. And I'll put it up on the screen for you. Pick it up when they came back. They went out, called by God to go out and preach the gospel, to put hands and feet on their faith, and, and to make disciples and so on. And so verse 30 of Mark chapter 6 begins, Then the apostles gathered to Jesus, and they told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. Very excited about what they had done and what they had taught and how God had worked through them. Verse 31, and he, Jesus, said to them, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while, for there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. Here's the deal. When we serve Jesus, sometimes it drains the tank. Sometimes it's exhausting. Many of you have served at our vacation Bible school over the summer, and you know that that is a long week. Right? And you, you serve the Lord. God does great works. You see kids coming to saving faith. And it's exciting about what God does. But when you get home about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it is crash time. Right? And, and so and you can imagine if your phone were to ring at that point and the call went out to say, hey, we missed some stuff. Need you to come back here for a couple of hours. You would just be like, take me now. God, you're exhausted. And so this is kind of what's going on here. They went out two by two. They're pumped up. Woo! You know, God, you've done all this great stuff. We want to talk about it. 
But, but yeah, we need a break. And Jesus senses that. You come away by yourself to a deserted place to rest, and you get, you're going to get some downtime. So they departed, verse 32, to a deserted place in the boat by themselves, but the multitude saw them departing. And many knew him, speaking of Jesus, obviously, and they ran there on foot from all the cities, and they arrived before them, and they came together to him. Now, they're going on a boat. How did they run there? They're at the Sea of Galilee, and basically, they went from point A to point B, and all the people ran around the side, and they came there. And so as they pull up on shore, all the people that Jesus had promised they're going to get away from and the break that they're going to get, there they are, and they're all screaming, Dr. Leo Marvin, Dr. Leo Marvin, right? Have you seen the movie, What About Bob? Now everybody reacts to that. How many of you have seen the movie? It's awesome. So it's What About Bob, man. They think they're getting a break. They show up, and here's everybody they thought they were getting a break from, and they're all saying, hey, how's it going? Now, uh, verse 34 says, Jesus, when he came out of the boat, and, and he saw great multitude, and he was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd, and so he began to teach them many things. Now, it doesn't tell us what the disciples saw, but I can I'm, I make a lot of assumptions about this text. I'll just tell you that what I see reading between the lines of the disciples probably weren't seeing them as sheep without a shepherd. They were probably seeing them as leeches that were going to suck them dry even further. They're like, can't we get away from you? Can't we get a break? Here you are again. I, I mean, I've been giving and giving and giving and giving and pouring out. But Jesus sees them as sheep not having a shepherd. He has compassion. He's teaching them. Verse 35, when the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and they said, this is a deserted place and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. Now again, it's me. It's me reading into the text, and maybe this wasn't how they were, but the way I see it is that they are kind of couching things in religious terms. They're coming across like, oh, we care about them. It's a deserted place. They got nothing to eat. I think what they're thinking is, this is a deserted place, and we barely have enough to eat, and we need a break, and they need to go away, and the basic pro and so the answer for them is, send them away. Verse 37, but he, Jesus, answered and he said to them, you give them something to eat. Now, if you're familiar with the story, you know what goes on from here is they start taking inventory. They're like, we ain't got enough for ourselves to eat, let alone all these people to eat. And it would cost an ocean of money to feed all these people. Like, logistically, what you're asking us to do is impossible. And of course, God does a miracle and 5,000 people are fed. And it's just a, a remarkable thing. Now, there's a huge lesson in this for us as Christians in the body of Christ. And that's this, that service is sacrificial. Serving God is sacrificial. It doesn't always conveniently fit into our schedule to serve God. Sometimes we think, you know, gosh, if it's difficult, if what's going down is inconvenient for me, if it costs me a little bit of something, then, then we have a tendency to think, well, that's not from God. Because, because, because this, got, this got some pain attached to it. This got some sacrifice attached to it. Listen, can I tell you, that's not, that's not always the case. Often that is not the case. Now, sometimes we have a tendency, if Satan he can't get you to take your foot off the gas, he'll get you to put your foot to the floor, and maybe the issue is, is that you're serving everywhere, and you're serving in places that God hasn't called you to serve, and you need to take your foot off the gas in certain areas. But listen, by and large, what I see as a pastor in 25 years is that that's usually not the issue. The issue is usually that the minute it starts having some ouch, some pain, some, some sacrifice element to it, people tap out and go, oh, no, that can't be of God. No, oftentimes it is. I think about Peter, Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 5. We read a story of Peter and the disciples, you know, James and John, they're there and they're out fishing. And they fish all night, which is what they do. They had the night shift. That's where they catch fish. It's at night. And they fished all night. And they were now back. And it's the daytime. And Jesus is preaching. And he comes walking up. And he's preaching. This crowd's crowding in. And so he wants to get into to Peter's boat, push out a little bit so the crowd doesn't smother him, get a little bit of separation, be able to preach the gospel to him. And so, so Peter, 
He's already brought his boat to shore. They've already cleaned the boat. He's now cleaning all his, you know, fishing nets and the tackle and all of that stuff. I mean, he's getting ready to go to bed. He wants to go home, you know, and I've worked all night. And Jesus gets in his boat, says, hey, put out a little bit, Peter. Put out a little bit from the shore. You know, are you willing to be put out a little bit? And Peter is like, yeah, all right. And, and, and so he sacrificially, what's he do? He goes out. And ultimately, as the story goes on, he's going to end up, all the stuff that he's cleaned up, his boat, all his gear, Jesus is going to have him fishing again. Sacrificial service. God calling him to do that work. Now, in both of these examples, in Mark chapter 6, where Jesus told his disciples, you feed them. And in, in Luke chapter 5, when Jesus told Peter, put out a little bit, let your nets down for a catch. Both of those in, instances, what you see is that their obedient sacrifice led to a miracle. Led to a miracle. Peter, when he lets down his net for the, to, for the fish, for the catch, as Jesus instructs, contrary to all reason, fills his boat so full it begins to sink. Calls his partner to come out. They fill his boat so full it begins to sink. It's, an, it's a miracle. Mark chapter 6, the disciples, they just start feeding, giving the people what, what they got. 5,000 people are saved. It's a miracle. Who saw the miracle? The sacrificing servants are the ones that saw the miracle. Same thing with Jesus' first miracle that he ever performed in the Gospels at the wedding feast in Cana. They run out of wine. And, and, and Mary, his mother, calls all the servants together. That She says, whatever he tells you to do, you do it. And he says, hey, take all these barrels, fill them up with water. And he turns them into wine. And nobody knew it but Jesus and the servants. It's the servants that putting out, sacrificially serving as the Lord commands, they're the ones that get to see the miracle. And listen, they didn't just see the miracle, they got to be a participatory part of the miracle. God involved them, God used them. But listen, they had to sacrifice to participate. Years ago, when, when Brenda and I planted our first church, Revival Christian Fellowship in Menifee, and, and now, today, you know, by God's grace, Going, cranking, thousands of people, it's awesome. But in the early days, it was, it was tough. We had a handful of people. We had a lot of opposition. We had local churches that didn't want us there. There were people calling up and complaining down at Calvary Chapel going, why are they here? We've got a Calvary Chapel in Canyon Lake. These people don't belong here. All of this stuff. And then we began to go through just a lot of persecution from the enemy. One of, one of the guys, a good friend of mine, Dave, his business failed right in the middle of it. My wife's business failed right in the middle of it, like going through extreme pressures. And one of the guys that was involved with us at one point, he says, he goes, gosh, maybe, <laughs> I don't know, man, it just seems like a lot of stuff is coming against us. Like maybe God doesn't want there to, to be, you know, this, this Calvary Chapel in Menifee. I'm like, dude, I know what God's doing. I know what he's called us to. And, and we're not leaving. We're not going anywhere. And, you know, I think back today, I think about the thousands of people who have come to a saving faith in Christ through that ministry. I think about all the churches that we planted out of that church, this, this church among them. And I think, what would have happened if we had tapped out? What would have happened if we said, man, that's, that's just, just, too much, just too painful. It's requiring too much sacrifice. Here's my point and what I want you to hear. God wants to do amazing things through you. He wants to do stuff that will blow your mind. There's miracles that God wants to do. And he's uniquely gifted you, created you, placed you here. And he wants to do those miracles through you. Now, when we planted Revival, we were in our 20s. It seems ridiculous to say that. I look back all of those years. We were in our 20s when we did that. And, you know, we're in our prime. Many of you, you're not in your 20s. You're past that. You're in midlife. And emotionally, midlife is very, very different than your 20s. When you're in your 20s, you know, you, you've got, you, you know, you're starting to, you see things differently. You have a lot more, a lot more idealistic picture of the world. 
a lot more we can do this kind of thing. And then what happens in your midlife years, you start dealing with what's been called a key part of your spiritual growth. You start dealing with disappointment. And what happens is now the idealism of youth has begun to to wear off. It's been said that midlife is where our dreams go to die. (laughs) That's sad. Midlife is where our dreams go to die. Now, listen, if you are in midlife, which would be 30, 50, 60, somewhere, that's midlife. And, and if you start thinking about, okay, I'm in that realm, the odds are you're tired, okay? If you've got kids in the mix, you're busy, you're distracted, you're paying the bills, paying the mortgage, paying the rent, whatever it is. And what happens is the idealism of the 20s begins to fade, doesn't it? The idealism of the 20s begins to go back, and now all of what happens with your dreams, they give way to what we call reality. And now here we are in reality, and, 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 and so we begin to do less things for God, frankly, in midlife. In midlife, we think, I'm, I'm less willing to take a risk, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I, I, this ain't my first rodeo kind of thing, and I've seen how you can fall off the horse kind of deal, and so... We just tend to take our foot off the gas spiritually, don't we? We do. And, and so the, the thing is, is what you need to understand, these can be the best years of your life. I was in my 40s when we planted this church with a handful of people in my living room. Now, they can be the best years of your life. And by the way, they better be. This is the longest season of your life, midlife. It's the longest part of your life. Now, listen, we live in a society that that prizes youth, right? Idealizes youth. The hair, the body, the stuff. And what happens is we begin, we fill our lives pursuing the American dream. And, And chasing things that frankly don't last that long. But they take on this value and this importance and we begin to chase after them. It's, it, it, Jesus talked about in the parables of the soils, sometimes what happens is that the, the weeds grow up and they choke out the, 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 the plant, the seed that's growing, and, and they make it unfruitful. And so many of us, we can get caught up in that, but what I want you to hear is that is not the value system in the kingdom. That, that, that's not, listen, it's, it, it's not about the stuff. It's not about the American dream. It's about making your life count. That's what I want you to hear. It's about making your life count. You can make your life count for the kingdom of God. I read this quote last night. I loved it. It's my current social media status uh, posting. J.A. Hall says this, many of us develop our sense of identity from our stuff. We begin to think that we are our home, we are our car, our clothes, our job, our hobbies, or whatever. But what happens to our identity if those things are suddenly taken away? What is it that happens to our identity? Does our identity, our sense of who we are, go with them? He says, I think not. Stuff is just stuff. Has no meaning except for the meaning that we attach to it. You can never find meaning among the meaningless, yet many of us spend entire lifetimes trying to do just that. See, listen, it's not about the stuff. It's not about the American dream. It's not about you like letting your spiritual dreams die. It's about making your life count. That's what this world is all about. That's what this faith is all about. And that takes faithfulness, faithfulness on your part. You can't buy it. You can't microwave it. And listen, the Bible makes it very clear that it doesn't stop when you meet, reach midlife. It's not a, it's not a point of saying, Oh, you know what? I'm older now. I've earned the right to take my foot off the gas and not do these kind of ventures of faith for God. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. Give me a verse that says that. Listen to what the psalmist said. Psalm 92, verses 12 through 14. The godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like cedars of Lebanon. For they are transplanted to the Lord's own house. They flourish in the courts of our God. Here it is. For even in old age, they will still produce fruit. They will remain vital and green. That's what God wants for you. God has designed you uniquely, individually, and he wants you to live a fruitful life well beyond your 20s, well beyond your youth, into your old age. 
That's what God wants for you. It doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter what, whether or not you've achieved the American dream. It's not about the American dream. It's about how God's gifted you and the work that he wants to do in you and through you as a participatory member of the kingdom of God in the body of Christ. Now hold that thought. Turn with me to three books to the left to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to camp out here for a couple of minutes. 1 Corinthians 12. We're going to verse 7. We'll start there. First Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 7, Paul is talking about the role that we play in the body of Christ, about God uniquely creating us and how the Spirit gifts us and what that means for us. Here's what he says, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one, Paul says, for the profit of all. Uh, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, verse 10, to another the workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues, verse 11, but one and the same Spirit works all of these things, distributing, here's what I want you to hear, distributing to each one individually as he wills, for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Paul here, listen, what he says is that the church is just like the human body. Your human body is made up of multiple different members, and every single one of those various members has a key role to play. It can't go on strike, and if they do go on strike, it creates a lot of problems systemically. You look at the human body, and it is a perfect picture of what the body of Christ is all about. All of these multiple parts doing their independent roles. In a 24-hour period, the average adult heart beats 104,000 times. Your blood travels 168 million miles. You breathe 23,000 times. You inhale 650 cubic feet of air. You eat 3.2 pounds of food on average in 24 hours. You drink 2.9 quarts of liquids. Uh, you speak 5,000 words, unless you're a dude, in which case it's about 45. You use 750 muscles. And, and you exercise 7 million brain cells. And some of us less than that. But here's the point. Each of these things depends on millions of cells, each doing their job individually, while at the same time working together in unison. This is what the body of Christ is supposed to be about. This is what we are supposed to be about here. Paul's saying, look, that's how it's supposed to be in the church. Now, he continues, verse 14. He says, for in fact, the body is not one member but many. And if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? And if the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he Pleased. You could write your name next to that verse. Verse 19, and if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Now here, what Paul's doing is he's introducing potential hindrances to the exercise of spiritual gifts. And, and basically, in verses 15 and 16, he's talking about those who think too little of their gifts. Some of you are in this place where you think, I don't have much to offer. I've, there's so many more people so much more qualified than me, and so on. And you just belittle or you think too little of your gift, and it causes you to, to, to be unwilling to sort of step out because, frankly, you just don't think you have that much to contribute, which is wrong thinking, by the way. We desperately need everybody's gifts in the body of Christ. But this is what Paul addresses there in verse 15 and 16. In verse 21, it's the opposite of that. He's addressing those who think too highly of their gift. 
You know, like they're God's gift to, to, to you and everybody else, you know. And what Paul says there in verse 18 is, look, God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. That, that God's placed you here, that our gifts are given to us strategically by God. And yes, we're all diverse. Yes, we're all different. Yes, we're all unique. But listen, it's essential to work together in the body of Christ, every healthy person part doing its job so that the body stays healthy, that we're using our independent gifts in an interdependent way. That's the body of Christ. Here's my question, obvious application. Are you doing this? Are you doing this? Are, are, are you using your spiritual gifts in this body of Christ as God has commanded Let me ask you this. Do you even know what your spiritual gift is? Do you know how God wants to use you? I have people come up to me all the time as a pastor. They'll say, Pastor Ted, I need to kind of figure out what God's will is for my life. Hey, listen, a big clue of knowing what God's will is for your life is taking a walk with how he's gifted you. If God gives you a spiritual gift, it's just no different than if you gave a gift to somebody. You put some thought into it. You buy a gift what's your hope for that? Next Christmas, you don't want to see them re-gifting your gift. Somebody go, oh, look what Joe got me. You're like, I'm pretty sure I bought that for Joe a year ago. Thanks a lot, Joe. No, God wants you to use the gift that he gives you, and it's a big clue as to where he, he's calling you, what he wants you to do in the body of Christ. What Paul is saying here is, look, there's, there's a huge difference there's a huge difference between, between how God's gifted and He wants to use you. Listen, by the way, spiritual gifts, if you don't know what your spiritual gift is, I'd encourage you to take a spiritual gifts test. You can talk to the folks at the Connection Center. We have them. Take a spiritual gifts test. Figure out how God's gifted you. Go back to Ephesians 4 real quick. Let's look again at verses 11 through 16. We've read it, but let's read it again. Here's what Paul says. That he himself... The Lord God gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. What's our job? For the equipping of the saints, you, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's your job. Your job is to do the work of the ministry. My job is to equip you. Your job is to then go out and do the work of the ministry, build the church up. That's God's design for the church, according to Scripture right here. The work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ, verse 13, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up. That's God's plan for you. He wants you to grow up. In all things into him who is the head, Christ, from which the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies. You could circle that, what every joint supplies, and you could write next to it your name. Because you're, you, you are to supply some, some portion of it. According to the effective working by which every part does its share. You could do the same thing there, circle it, put your name next to it. And you might add, add the question, am I doing my share? What happens if you do that? Well, he goes on, it causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. That when you serve the gift, with the gifts that God's given to you, God uses you to grow the body up, grow it, mature it in love. Again, what Paul's saying is there's a difference between a consumer mentality and a contributor mentality. Ocean, a difference between the two. In a consumer mentality, listen, the church exists to serve you. If you come into the church with a consumer mentality, then the church's sole existence is to take care of you. It's like a mommy-baby relationship or a business transaction. You know, the mommy-baby relationship, what, you know, what it, what's, what's the baby's role in that? The suck you dry, right? And everything revolves around the child. Just all about me, 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 and your job is, to, is me. And, 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 and you know, that, that's fine for babies. But babies are meant to grow up. Same thing, business transaction. You know, everything, if you think about a business transaction, everything revolves around the customer. 
Customer is always right. It's all about the business taking care of me, the customer. Taking care of me, the consumer. So how can I give the least amount of my time, my money, my effort, and get the best re- return? That's, that's what a consumer thinks about. Some Christians are consumers. They come into a church, they, and they, they're looking, they're, they're shopping, like, okay, what, what, what is the, what's the church got to offer me? How, you know, and so they go shopping around for who's going to give them the best return, you know, and where can I put in the least amount of time and money and effort and, and all of this stuff. Some Christians are like that with their churches. Look, Jesus didn't establish the church for consumers. He established the church for the body of Christ that we would be participatory contributors to the body of Christ. I always point people back. Anytime we're in ministry, anytime we're dealing with stuff, and we're talking about spiritual principles, I always point back to the family because God reveals himself in his creation. Your family, yeah, you take care of one another. Yeah, you nurture one another. Yeah, there's roles and responsibilities that differ in a family, but everybody is expected to contribute to the family. I just tell my kids that all the time growing up. You are not King Farouk. Your mom is not your servant. This world does not revolve around you. Clear your plate. Do your dishes. Take out the trash. Why? Because you live here. This is your home. This is your family. And say, why should we think things are any different in the church? It's not. Jesus established the church that we as Members of the body of Christ, members of the family of God, we would be contributors, not consumers. Now, here's the contributor mentality. A contributor mentality says, you know what? When I come to the church, I understand the pastors and the elders, they exist to equip me to do the work of the ministry. They equip me to, they exist to help me grow so that I can then use my gifts to serve other people. A contributor doesn't ask, how can I give the least amount of time? How can I give the least amount of money? How can I give the least amount of effort and get the best return? No, a contributor says, how can I give my money? How can I give my time? How can I give my gifts and my my capabilities for the best return of the body of Christ? That's what a contributor does. That's what you're called to be. See, one's just a business. The other one's family. One's just a baby that needs to grow up. But the other one's a maturing member of a family, of the body of Christ. Which one are you? Which one are you? Here's the deal. If you are a consumer and not a contributor, you're missing out. You're the one who's getting the raw end of the deal. Yes, the body of Christ, the family that you're a part of is missing out. You're harming them by not being involved. But ultimately, you're hurting yourself. You're the one that's missing out. The world is filled with takers. Why would you want to be one? We hate takers, don't we? Somebody who shows up, they just take, 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 take. Tell the story about jammy boy and just, oh, I put on my jammies, can't help you. Sorry, tough luck that the boat's going into the rocks. And we don't like that. Why would we want to be a taker? God wants us to be a contributor, not a consumer. If you offer yourself to Christ so he can work through you, listen, you can change the world. And you're sitting next to people that by using their gifts, they're changing the world. They're they're changing people's lives one at a time. My buddy Bob, when we were first starting this this church, he was going through a lot of stuff. And and he wasn't, you know, super mature in the Lord at that point. But he decided, I'm just going to go out and, and we needed somebody to help direct people. And so he said, I'll put on that stupid vest and I'll go out and do this. And he shared with me years later about how he was dying inside. But this simple act of saying, I'm not going to be a consumer, I'm going to be a contributor, put Bob on a trajectory where he was available to God. I can't tell you the number of people that he has led to a saving faith in Christ. Led to the Lord. And it all started with an attitude that says, my life's fallen apart, but I'm I'm going to just seek to be obedient. Paul told the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. He said, you should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Listen, that's my challenge to you today. I challenge you to step out. 
to serve Jesus with your time, with your gifts, with your money, with your capabilities, just to be able to say, I am not going to be a consumer, I'm going to be a contributor. I want you to discover how that a life lived for others, a life lived in service to God, it will change your life in ways that you never dreamed possible. That's what I want for you. Jesus said this in Matthew's gospel. He said, forever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And that word find is key. It, the idea there is that it's something you discover after searching for it high and low. And here's what I know. I know that people are searching for life. They search for it high. They search for it low. They seek to fill all kinds of stuff in their life just to try to find that and discover that American dream or that hope or that satisfaction. And Jesus said, you only find it when you lose your, your life for my sake. I want to share with you a heartbreaking truth. It's in my notes. And I, and I, I really don't, not comfortable about sharing this, but I'm just going to share it. The heartbreaking truth is that the majority of you are consumers and you're not contributors. Now, if you're a baby in Christ, you get a little bit of a pass. If you're not a Christian, then, then this, I'm talking to the family of God, would encourage you to come to know the Lord and be part of that family. But the statistical fact, guys, 60% of this church does nothing, doesn't serve, doesn't give. You're a consumer, you're not a contributor. I'll just simply say this, you, you are missing out. You are the poorer for it. And your brothers and sisters in Christ are the poorer for it. And so what I want for us God is changing the world through people that you're sitting next to and he can change the world through you. I'm not saying you have to go out and plant a church. I'm saying you have to do something to serve God obediently because the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And if it's good enough for Jesus, by God, it's good enough for us. 